Welcome to the History of Parliament's YouTube channel. My name's Sammy Sturgis, and I'm the Public Engagement Manager at the History of Parliament Trust. In this video from our Parliamentary Leadership Series, I'll be speaking to Dr Emma Peplow about Dennis Healy, the Labour Party leader that never was. Emma is Head of Development at the History of Parliament and coordinator of our Oral History Project. She is also the co-editor of a recently published collection of extracts from the project entitled The Political Lives of Post-War British MPs, An Oral History of Parliament. Dennis Healy, 1917 to 2015, was a Labour politician whose career spanned the second half of the 20th century and the first decade of the 21st century. His career was strongly influenced by his experiences in the Second World War. The main reason I went into politics was to stop a Third World War because wars are made by governments and you can only really decide, influence that if you're involved in uh, politics and indeed government. By the end of the 1970s, he was in pole position to become Labour leader, but this was not to be. Here, we'll discover why. The big thing to remember about politics is that in politics, your opponents are in the other party, your enemies are in your own. So, thanks for joining me to talk about Dennis Healy's career today. Um, it would be great in the first instance if you could just give us a brief background of his family and also his political um, life before Parliament. Absolutely. So um, Dennis Healy was born in Kent in 1917, but he moved to um, Heathley, Yorkshire um, as a young child um, following his father's um, position as head of Keithley Technical School. Um, Healy was an incredibly intelligent um, young man and he had a very strong influence in literature and the arts and culture inspired by his mother Winnie who was a key influence on his life. Uh, he wasn't a particularly political child until he um, won a scholarship to um, Balliol College of Oxford um, and it was really in Oxford where his uh, political interests blossomed. Um, he fits in very well to the sort of pre-war anti-fascist um, left-wing atmosphere that is um, is the Oxford uh, Oxford University in the 1930s. Uh, he joins the Communist Party, he becomes the chair of the Labour Club, he is made president of his college um, student body, um, interestingly the year after Ted Heath is president of the same college student body. So um, his political interests certainly blossom while he's in Oxford. Um, although he's a pacifist um, at the time, um, he later told us in his interview with us for our oral history project that he actually regretted not joining the International Brigade and fighting in the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. So he's very successful academically in Oxford. Um, he widens his intellectual interest, but he also becomes much, much more politically engaged. Um, and as war breaks out, um, he volunteers for the army. He's allowed to finish his degree. He gets a very prestigious double first. And age 23 in 1940, he joins up. Um, he has a very good war. Um, he is very successful uh, in the army. Uh, most famously, he's involved in the planning and execution of the Anzio landings. And again, he told us that the war taught him um, and the army taught him both the need to plan, but also the need to react when plans are then changed by engagement with the enemy. Um, so by the end of the war, um, he's turned down an academic job at Oxford and he's decided that he wants to go into politics. Yeah. Um, so he'd, um, although he's um, had been a member of the Communist Party, uh, he joins the um, he joins the Labour Party and he gets very deeply involved at that point. Um, he tells us in, in our interview many times that he went into politics to stop a third world war. Yeah. Um, and this is the key driving force between, for his um, entry into the Labour Party. Um, he also has told us that he doesn't just want to be, he didn't just want to be in the Labour Party, he wanted to be in government, he wanted to be in power in order that his um, ambitions and his philosophy can be turned in to, to, he, to actually do something with his political life and not just be involved in politics. Um, yeah. 
So although he stands in 1945 for the Labour Party, he stands in a safe Tory seat um, and he doesn't win, but he's noticed within the party and he becomes the international secretary, which is a very important position at that yeah. point. Um, this is 1940, you know, this is in just after the war. Uh, the position gives him contacts with um, socialist parties all across the world and in particular in Europe which is um, dividing between East and West as the Cold War starts to break out. So yeah. Healy remembered this as the most valuable period of my life. Um, and the experience of dealing with social democratic parties in the East of Europe in particular, who are fighting their own battles with Soviet backed communist parties, that really, uh, really cements his um, views on uh, really cements his anti-communist views. Yeah. Um, he is very close to the then Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin, who um, was a key player in the formation of NATO. And so he leaves this position in 1952 as a still a committed, strong social democrat, but a very, very strong anti-communist and with a real belief in a need for strong defense um, and a strong Cold War position against the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah, so by 1952, which is when he is elected as um, the Labour member for Leeds South East um, in a by-election, he obviously has had quite a trajectory there that has been influenced by his experiences in the war, which it seems, you know, as you said, that really shaped his ambitions within politics. And he had a great interest in national politics and quickly distinguished himself within the Labour Party, um, proving himself to be very able in the House of Commons. And he became the Defence Secretary in um, Harold Wilson's government. And again, continued to distinguish himself. And I think it would be great if you could just sort of speak to how significant that role was in him positioning himself for the later le leadership races that he would take part in. Yes, absolutely. So by this point, he's made himself indispensable because of his knowledge of foreign affairs to any Labour leader. And Wilson certainly sees this and, in fact, is a bit nervous about making him foreign secretary in case he becomes too powerful. Mm -hmm. So he becomes defence secretary. He is very well respected both by the armed forces because of his war record, but also within Parliament because of his um, wide and deep knowledge base and the issues. He has some quite successful periods. He's very successful at cutting, um, cutting a lot of the spending of the armed forces. Um, and he's also successful in convincing um, or helping to convince Wilson that Britain should definitely stay out of the Vietnam War. Yeah. Um, he has some regrets. Um, he regrets selling arms to um, apartheid South Africa as part of an anti-communist drive. But in, by Labour's loss in 1970, he's really established himself as a major figure in the Labour Party. He's a good performer in yeah. Parliament. Um, he's shown he can take really tough decisions. Um, he's incredibly knowledgeable and well respected. Uh, he's loyal. Uh, he's seen as loyal to cabinet um, colleagues in public, whatever he says to them in private. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, some of his weaknesses are already starting to show. He has a caustic yeah. wit. And when that's used against Labour members rather than Conservative members, that doesn't help his position within the party. Um, and he, he told us in his interview that he didn't want to join the cliques in his party in the House of Commons. But what this means is that he wasn't able to build up his own support base or his own following within the Labour Party in contrast to other senior Labour figures at this time. Um, and so he's seen as a bit of a loner and a, perhaps a bit arrogant by some of his colleagues in the Labour Party. Yeah. So then there's a, a bit of backwardsing and forwardsing between the Labour Party and the Conservatives in the 1970s there. So um, when Labour were in opposition between 1970 and 1974, he became the shadow chancellor. And then in 1974, he became the chancellor. Again, sort of, you know, moving up, continuing up the ladder um, on his trajectory. Could you perhaps say a little bit about how that role was significant to him standing in two, the two leadership elections that he that he did? 
Yes, absolutely. So Healy definitely took on the chancellor role, not because of his interest in economics, um, mm -hmm. but because he saw it as a step to become Labour leader. He stands for Labour leader in 1976 when Wilson stands down, but he doesn't fare very well within that election. Um, he stays on as chancellor and the key point in his chancellorship is the 1976 IMF crisis, um, yes. which is really a political victory for Healy. Um, a sterling crisis in 76 um, has forced the UK to go to the IMF for a loan and uh, Healy is able to convince the rest of the cabinet not just to accept the loan but also to accept the conditions that the IMF place on the loan so serious restrictions on public spending. Now he's very successful also in carrying this out um, up until about 1978 so um, Britain only actually needed half of the IMF's loan um, and it sort of looked like spending, public spending was getting under control. Um, unfortunately for Healy, um, by 1978, 1979, the unions are half completely fed up with spending restrictions and wage restraint. And so there's a series of very significant strikes in what becomes known as the winter of discontent. And it's this period that leads to Callaghan's government falling in 1979 and Margaret Thatcher coming into power. Yeah. So then after that, after that crisis happens and the government falls, um, it's not immediately that Callaghan steps down. So the leadership race that happens, you know, happens about a, a year later, I think, in, in 1980. And at that point, you know, Healy is sort of seen as a front runner for the leadership, but he doesn't win. You know, Michael Foote is elected and it would be great if you could tell us why you think that happened you know yeah what happened there and and then also go on to talk a little bit about how um healy was appointed the deputy leader and the rivalry that ensued there with tony benn yeah so after labor lost in 1979 the party is really dividing amongst um, amongst itself, there's a significant split between the hard left led by Tony Benn, who's mm -hmm. really pushing a very, very left wing agenda and is very popular in, um, in the unions and in um, constituency Labour parties across the country. And then there's a right wing of the, the Labour Party who want to be considered a more uh, broad based, wider church party, certainly still a social democrat party, but not to the extremes that Tony Benn is arguing for. Now, mm -hmm. by the 1980 election, um, Healy is certainly the front runner um, and is seen as the, the candidate of the right, but he's not willing to champion the right. He's not really to stand up and argue for this at this point because of the growth in left wing support within the Labour Party. And if anything, he takes the right wing of the Labour Party completely for granted. He reportedly says that they have nowhere else to go um, but to vote for him. And so this, he ends up losing the support of some of his natural allies, who some of which are already thinking about leaving the Labour Party and forming a new centrist party. Um, on the other hand, MPs who are threatened by the left the growth of the left wing in their own constituencies don't want Healy as leader either and they also vote for foot. So there's a lot that Healy did himself that um, prevented him from becoming a leader in 1980 and that was certainly a big shock to him yes. and a huge setback in his career. Um, he's made deputy leader um, automatically um, after the election and he's by it so in the, in 1980, he's deputy leader, which is the position he doesn't want of a party that's divided hugely between left and right, uh, with many of his natural allies planning to leave um, the party. And in fact, in 1981, um, and many of the more right wing Labour Party members do leave, they form the Social Democrat Party. And in, almost immediately after this happens, uh, Tony Benn challenges um, Healy for the uh, deputy leadership. And it's, I mean, he describes, um, uh, Healy describes having um, opponents in the opposite side of parliament, but his enemies were all in his own party. Mm. And then he describes as above all, above all his enemy in the Labour Party. So in, um, 
in the sort of six months of 1981, uh, the SDP is growing in strength and support with many defections of right wing or more right wing members and more right wing members of parliament. Um, Tony Benn is fighting for a considerably uh, a very left view of what the Labour Party should stand for. And um, Healy fights for this position and really fights for the soul of the Labour Party. This isn't something he wants to do for his own ambition. This is because he feels he has a duty to defend what he believes the Labour Party should be. Yeah. So um, he's what, and this, in this campaign, he loses a lot of this arrogant image that he'd gained before. He's seen as much more in touch and much more likable. And it's a very, very narrow victory for him as deputy leader um, in yeah. 1981, as 50.4 to 49.6% he manages to stay deputy leader. And this is seen as a sort of turning point and the end of Ben and the left's rise in the Labour Party. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think, um, I mean, I know we can never know, um, but do you think that had Healy become the leader that the situation with the SDP would have happened? Do you think that party would still have been informed or not? Um, I think it, it's certainly, I think some of the MPs who were planning to go, I think would have gone anyway. There's some suggestion yeah. that they voted for foot deliberately in order to make their path easier to form the Social Democrat Party. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, if Healy had been Labour leader, the need for a centrist party would have been much less obvious and you'd right. have to that they wouldn't the they wouldn't have got the initial support that they had done from people who wanted this centrist broad based but still social democrat alternative to Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. So Healy, um, after all of that, um, you know, continued to have a political career for some years. You know, he he only died in 2015, so he he was an uh, an active or semi-active member towards the end, I guess, um, in the House of Lords, he was, he talked as well of his time in the House of Lords in our interview, very favourably, um, probably more so than his time in the House of Commons. And I think maybe just to round up, if you could say a little bit more about that transition, that would be great. Yes, Healy stays um, in the Shadow Cabinet under Kinnock. He speaks on foreign affairs until he decides to stand down in um, 87 and then stand down from Parliament in 92. Mm -hmm. uh, he certainly did prefer the Lords in many ways to the Commons. Um, he uh, valued the expertise of the House of Lords. He valued being able to speak to his own expertise rather than worrying about political battles within his own party or jostling for position and so on. Um, so yes, he was uh, certainly continued to speak, particularly on foreign affairs, um, up until uh, very late on in the 2000s. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, thanks very much for your time today, Emma. No problem.